Canada and Connecticut and California and Missouri and Maine and Arizona and the great state of Texas. So welcome to all of you who are joining online tonight. And please make sure to use that chat function to, uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask at the, um, have us ask Bill at the end of the session, or if you just want to share your joy at being together with us tonight for this auspicious occasion. Now, I'd love to see a show of hands um, as we enter our sixth season. Is it, has anyone here been coming to read the revolution since 2017? From, yeah, was anybody at the first one with, in July of 2017? with Alan Taylor, we've got a few veterans here, fantastic. This is great, so as you can see, we have a real loyal audience for the Read the Revolution series. Um, I would also like to um, uh, welcome our good friends from right across the street, the Independence Historical Trust. Uh, these are the folks who are the nonprofit partner for Independence National Historical Park. <laughs> Uh, they do lots of great work. They go back to the bicentennial era uh, to raise money through private philanthropy to support the work of the park for preservation, education, uh, et cetera. And they have a project that is near and dear to our hearts right now, and that is the restoration of the First Bank of the United States. I'm literally looking at it, for those of you who are online, out the window here. Uh, an incredible building, the first federal uh, structure that was um, designed and built and built of local King of Prussia marble right across the street from where we're standing. That building is being restored. It will have uh, exhibitions exploring the history of uh, the 18th century economy, founding era finance, the financial system that was uh, created during the era of Hamilton, which is of course the subject of our discussion uh, this evening. And um, so we're really excited. Tom Caramanico, uh, Jonathan Burton, and our friends from the trust are here. Uh, you could, if you were interested in exploring a little bit more of this project, um, their website in your Google machine is just INHT for Independence National Historical Trust.org, and there's uh, great information about the work that they're doing here. We're really excited at the idea that by 2026, as we're celebrating the 250th anniversary of uh, the founding of the nation and the Declaration of Independence, that there'll be a great new attraction right across the street that's very complimentary to the work we do here uh, at the museum. I also want to mention uh, yeah, just a shot of some of uh, the concepts for the exhibitions. We also have, for those of you who are in the audience, you've seen this, but for those of you online, uh, we started last year, for those of you who, uh, who are online uh, visitors, you know that we often will put display objects from the museum's collection that relate to the evening. So we've got a, a money scale that you see in the upper right of this uh, image. This is a, a great reminder that before the creation of this national system of finance and in advances in banking, that um, it was very difficult to change currency if you were a uh, merchant in a place like Philadelphia. What you see here is actually a little money scale with a table of conversion for hard currency, for paper currency in different colonies, um, a little scale for weighing uh, if you had silver or gold uh, to try to um, do your exchange rate, your internal exchange rate in the period. Now this is a particularly interesting one in that it, was, it belonged to a member of the Boone family from Ole Valley, which is uh, but 60, 80 miles west of where we're sitting here in Philadelphia. Of course, a member of that uh, English Quaker family named Daniel Boone, at the time this uh, money scale was inscribed by a cousin of Daniel Boone's in 1773. Cousin Daniel was down in Kentucky during uh, the Revolutionary Era, but he came back for a visit with the family at the end of the Revolutionary War, and James Boone, who owned this, noted in the family Bible that cousin Daniel and family had come back for a visit um, to uh, Pennsylvania. So it's got a great historical association as well. And then a piece of paper currency here um, that uh, was issued here in Philadelphia in 1776. We love the little image of uh, a heron or a crane being attacked by an eagle and in Latin, the motto is exitus in dubio est, or the outcome is uncertain, which is certainly um, uh, a motto that applies perhaps to our own day as well. <laughs>
looking forward to some uh, opportunities to, for those of you here in person or those of you watching who have an opportunity to come to Philadelphia. The British are back in November uh, 5th and 6th. This is the weekend, first weekend in November. This has become one of our uh, most exciting sort of neighborhood takeovers. We have 60 or 70 living history uh, enthusiasts that come back dressed as British soldiers, dressed as civilians of Philadelphia. We set up a market on the on the uh, plaza of the museum. If you have grandchildren or children's nephews, nieces, there's an activity package. You can come. There's a spy challenge, which is usually the hook for for bringing kids here, and it's a great sort of fun weekend to uh, remember the time in which Philadelphia was occupied or liberated, depending upon your political perspective, uh, in 1777. Uh, and the next slide, if you just absolutely are excited that the British Army has arrived and you no longer have those dirty rabscallions who've taken over the Pennsylvania State House and the tea has finally returned in those British ships, you can join us uh, for a member's uh, tea time on uh, Sunday the 6th of November, which is a lot of fun. And then finally, uh, looking forward to February, we're incredibly excited about our new special exhibition. And I know some of you enjoyed uh, the paintings of Don Triani, which was our special exhibition uh, for this past year. We will open in February, February 11th to the public, but for those of you of members, you will be able invited to a special preview uh, of this exhibition, Black Founders, the Fortin family of Philadelphia. Now, James Fortin was born literally less than a block from where I'm standing here, right down Third Street in the Dock Ward in Philadelphia, born a free African-American in 1766. At age nine, he heard the Declaration of Independence read in the State House yard just down the street, two blocks from where I'm standing, to the west. Uh, went aboard a privateer ship at age 14, celebrated his 15th birthday on Chestnut Street, seeing General Washington's army marching to victory at Yorktown and remembered as an elderly man in the 1830s, seeing companies of black troops among Washington's army, filled with pride, filled with commitment that he and his family were part of the founding of the nation. And we have this incredible exhibition that is bringing back to Philadelphia for the first time from descendants of the Fortin family who live as far away as Arizona and Illinois, objects that descended in the family to tell the story of the American Revolution and its impact on a Philadelphia family and Philadelphia's black community in the century between 1776 and 17, or 1876, sorry. So it's gonna be a really great um, exhibition. And so finally, it's time to introduce our speaker tonight, Bill Hoagland, William Hoagland, as he is more formally known. Um, I just wanted to share, I mentioned the Little Red Book, Chairman Bill's Little Red Book, um, called Inventing American History, which is just a series of essays and reflections on public history. And it came at, for me personally, just a really exciting time when we were just starting to imagine the exhibitions uh, here at the museum and how we would tell the, a story, not the story, of the American Revolution. Um, Bill has, has been someone who really holds the public history field, uh, holds our feet to the fire, saying our role is really not to just go find heroes or to celebrate, but really to explore honestly difficult parts of, um, of our past and to grapple with um, the real history of the American Revolution the founding of the nation, um, our history as a people now approaching a quarter millennium. And so I've loved his Autumn of the Black Snake. I've loved his Declaration. These are just my shelf copies here. Finding, uh, founding Finance, which was sort of the inspiration for tonight. But the book has been so popular, we could not find the copy today because it has been taken by so many of our educators uh, to read. And so, um, again, this talk uh, was sort of inspired by a conversation that we had back in 2020, and we were interested in, in getting Bill here uh, to really draw, I think, on a lot of his work to talk about Alexander Hamilton, about the first bank of the United States, the creation of the financial system. So I know you're going to enjoy this talk very much. We'll have an opportunity for some questions. If Again, if uh, those of you who are watching online, if, if uh, there's questions you'd like to ask, please put those in the chat. We'll make sure those are asked. And um, uh, please join me in welcoming Bill Hoagland.
Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, uh, I'm glad that picture of me is gone. It was taken about like 12 years ago or something. And could have been kind of an unpleasant uh, visual uh, comparison. I, it's amazing to be looking at the bank that I'm really I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and uh, I think it was Scott who said uh, there was a great exhibit here uh, among many. Uh, Hamilton was here. What, that was the name of the exhibit, and it was here. Um, and we were we, I was checking it out, and we were talking, and uh, I think he, he said, you know, that's the biggest Hamilton artifact anywhere, and we have it right there across the street. We were in the cafe downstairs looking through the window. It was, and I, I thought then, like, I want to talk about the bank um, to this particular audience. Um, so it's just extremely exciting to be back here, sort of back in this kind of setting with real people, not people only online, which is great to have as well, but also some real people in the room. It's, uh, I, I couldn't figure out earlier today, we were kind of doing a sound check and talking and stuff, and I was like, why am I so excited? I mean, I get excited before talks, but this just feels different. And I was like, oh yeah, it's totally different. I haven't done anything like this in you know almost three years. Um, so it's very, very good. I don't usually start my talks by saying how good it is to be somewhere, but it is really, really good to be right here looking at that bank, talking to all of you, both online and in real life. Um, so it's a Hamilton artifact, right? Of course it is. It's a giant Hamilton artifact. He actually started the bank, I mean, got the bank through Congress. The building itself took a number of years to build, of course. So in a way, it's sort of like a, a ghost of Hamilton that stuck around a long, long time after he was Treasury Secretary. Um, but it's, there are other people involved, too. Um, I talk a lot about Hamilton. I was talking, you know, You've heard of him, probably, because in the past few years, a number of years ago, he became suddenly extremely famous because of the musical. And before that, um, I was talking about him, and he, I would have to kind of fill people in on like who he was and what he did and so forth. But some of that stuff is now, um, at least some of the outlines are known uh, to more people. But this is also a story, you know, banking, the banking story, the national banking story, is also a story about Jefferson it's also a story about Madison. It's also a story about Albert Gallatin, who does not have a musical, uh, and uh, was a treasury secretary who's, who, he wasn't his immediate uh, successor, but he, he's the important one who succeeded Hamilton, who was treasury secretary for much longer than Hamilton was, which I'll talk about in a minute. So there's other people involved here, you know, um, besides Hamilton. And um, the thing about the bank that I really want to push is its centrality, I mean, it's not actually technically a central bank, it's a national, it was at first, it was the national bank. But I mean centrality not in a financial sense, I mean centrality to the founding story. And that may seem a little weird, like it might seem like, well, you start a country, you know, from scratch, and then you're like, oh, we need, uh, we probably need a, some kind of financial system here. And I don't think that's how it went um, at all. I think it really, you could almost flip it. I mean, it's worth, it's a useful lens anyway to understanding the founding, to kind of flip that a little bit and think of many of the drivers for forming the nation came from the desire for a financial system, uh, a certain kind of financial system that didn't exist here um, before the country was formed. So that's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty extreme flip, but I think it's justifiable. Um, and I think people, the tricky part is not everyone, you know, is super interested in finance, right? If you use the word finance, it doesn't sound like it's that interesting. But if you use the word finance to Alexander Hamilton, I mean, this is what got him up in the morning and out the door. You know, this, is, this was excitement. This was about being big and powerful and rich and change and innovation and all that stuff. Um, and that's, you know, I think finance people kind of get that maybe the bank uh, was more central than many people uh, think. Um, but here's the, so finance people sometimes like the kind of stories I tell. Um, the flip side of that is it's not all 100% edifying the way the financial system kind of drove the formation of the country. So, you know, it's that thing Scott was just talking about. I mean, it's, it, there's a number of different angles and sides to this, and it kind of refracts. Talking about the bank can refract a lot of things we think about the founding of the country in, I think, interesting ways, ways that are even relevant to what we political fights that are going on right now, I mean right now, and have been really ever since it, found, was, it began. So, to talk about the bank, uh, it was not the first bank in the minds of the people who uh, created it, it was the bank, as uh, a ranger was giving a, a really great talk today as we, some of us were taking a tour inside the building, it was the bank, it wasn't the first bank, they, they didn't know there was going to be 
a second bank, necessarily. Um, those who hated the bank thought there would be no bank, and those who liked the bank thought the bank would stick around. So, um, but before the first bank, and this is the thing, before the first bank, um, there was another bank. It was called the Bank of North America, and this is before there was a constitution and a national government. And this was founded by uh, Robert Morris, um, a famous Philadelphian, um, but not famous as famous as he really ought to be beyond some of the people who just know Philadelphia and Pennsylvania history. You will not hear any mention of him in the musical about Hamilton. He's barely mentioned in some of the more recent biographies of Hamilton. I mean, barely mentioned. He was Hamilton's mentor in finance, and in that sense, in um, all the things I just said, finance is actually code for, like wealth and size and power and all that stuff that got these people quite excited about, for, about forming a nation. So um, he needs to be better known. And I've been working on that, you know, so we'll see. The, uh, <laughs> I've been trying. Um, I am sort of referring to a bunch of books I've written. I was so happy to see Scott show them all uh, to you, but um, except for the one that's so popular, it's news to me, I gotta tell you, that's so popular, you can't even find a copy of it anywhere, Founding Finance. I'm kind of focusing on the stuff I talk about in those books, so you can look into a lot more detail uh, and better stories than I can get in right now in the time we have, if you want to check them out. But I'm also talking about a book that is not out yet that I'm going to, uh, should be, I hope it'll be coming out next year, because I've written a lot about Hamilton before, and I'm writing about him again, and Morris. But I'm turning the corner now and talking about Albert Gallatin, too, another person who is not as well known as he ought to be. Um, and so there's a kind of an arc there. Uh, you know, it's Morris, the official arc of forming the, the economic nation which to these people meant the nation. They didn't need to say the economic nation. That's how they looked at things. Um, the official arc is Morris, Hamilton, Gallatin. And there's a lot of conflict in that, in that arc. Um, so that's, that's one thing I just kind of want to, and that all has to do with what the bank was, was doing and why people loved the bank and hated the bank. So um, you're kind of getting the, the first talk for a book that isn't out yet, um, a year ahead. It, you could see it as kind of an exclusive sneak preview, but it's more like you're kind of the guinea pigs for my trying to get this story told in a reasonable amount of time. So um, I appreciate your patience with that, uh, being pushed into that role. Um, because there's some weird, I'll just sort of share with you, some weird kind of time bends in this narrative that I had to confront as a writer. And since I'm at least as interested as in sort of the narrative challenges of this kind of work that I do as I am in the content, um, I found this one quite striking. And I will mark it when I get to it so you know what I'm talking about. Because we have to talk about Morris, we have to talk about Hamilton, and we have to talk about Gallatin. And uh, that covers a ridiculous amount of time. And Hamilton wasn't Treasury Secretary very long, really, compared to Gallatin. Um, and yet there's so much happened in what could actually just be backstory to Gallatin, to the Jefferson period, that you really have to, you have to kind of uh, spend a, lot of, a certain amount of time on that in telling the story. So Hamilton was a student of Morris. That's, a, that's just a key factor. The, the things Hamilton did that were so revolutionary in setting up a national finance system, he learned from Morris. He was better at it than Morris in many, many ways. He was more sophisticated in the end, like the student outstripping the master sort of thing, but he was definitely a student of Morris, and he took no instruction, Hamilton, from anyone else, really, about anything. I mean, he was not, he was an insubordinate sort of guy, and thought he knew everything better than anybody else, thought he was the smartest guy in the room, frequently he probably was, but that didn't make him super easy to get along with, but he did learn a lot from, from Morris. And it's the bank, it's the bank that got Morris and Hamilton together. How did they meet? Well, Hamilton sent Morris a letter, a letter. He was in the army still, was, the revolution was going on. Morris was the superintendent of finance for the Congress uh, here. And um, he, one day he gets this, like, it must have been, no one's ever said anything about it, this must have been this thick, thick envelope from Alexander Hamilton, who was, you know, we known to him as like Washington, on, had been on Washington's staff, was a son-in-law of the Schuyler family. You know, they all knew, each, all these top rich people knew each other. Uh, at that point, they were all engaged in the revolutionary activity, but he gets this thing like, he comes to his office of finance here in Philadelphia, 
I always like to imagine Morris opening it up and kind of like, oh, you know, dear superintendent or whatever, however it begins, I don't remember, dear Mr. Morris, and then like it rolling out on the floor, like a call the way across the floor, like, what's this? And it was, you know, and Hamilton starts out, you know, just a few thoughts uh, I have about, you know, where he was, a few thoughts about uh, national, about public banking and blah, 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 and then, you know, it's not a few thoughts, it's a design for a national style bank before there was a nation here. Um, and it was very, Morris found it both, he had a sense of humor, he called it a performance, Hamilton's letter. He wrote back to say, thank you for your performance. Uh, and that was pretty apt, because it really was. I mean, Hamilton showed Morris, like, who he was and what he could do and how he could think about high-level, high sophisticated finance matters. Um, and Morris liked that. He, th he thought it was crazy because Hamilton wanted, like, a $100,000 capitalization or some, I can't remember the number now. It was too high for, for Morris. was like, we're never going to get that. And he was right. I mean... Hamilton was, what he, what he was always doing, like straining forward, like, no, 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 it's got to be bigger, it's got to be faster, Let's, we can do it. Um, but Morris liked that. And Morris had, was at the same time working on his own bank plan for a quasi-national bank before there was a nation. So they had this thing in common right, right away, and it was, it was national type of banking before there was a nation. The idea, they both had it, it's just that Morris was in a position of greater power to begin to try to bring it about, and he brought Hamilton onto his team, basically. Um, the, thing that, the thing that they had was this idea that you could actually drive the creation of a nation, which is what they wanted, not just a collection of 13 states that are confederated for the purpose of fighting a war, but they could drive consolidation through the, through the finance system. So it's an oddball thing, and a number of historians have noted how odd this is, and it can be hard to talk about, that our first sort of nationalists, our first thinkers about like actual nationhood, you know, were bankers, were high finance people. Um, were, and what that meant was they were wealthy people trying to get wealthier using financial uh, mechanisms and using government to that end. So that's a different way to look at the founding than we usually get. But it, the, and the bank was supposed to be the hub for this system. Morris called this, he made no bones about calling this, the money connection, this thing he was trying to create. The money connection. And what he meant was the wealth, consolidating the wealth of the nation in a very few hands, private hands, via government action. That's the money connection. He wanted a powerful elite to be getting richer by building out the country. You know, it was patriotic in the sense that he wanted to build out the country and make it bigger and stronger and more powerful and richer. And he wanted to do that by consolidating the wealth of the country in the hands of hmm, himself and his friends who were merchants in Philadelphia, many of them, and other rich people throughout the country. So it's a double-edged thing, how you can sort of bring the country together, unify the country, through financial systems like internal taxation, uh, for example, not just import taxes, but internal taxation, tax everybody directly from the federal, by, by a federal government. Federal meant confederated originally. It came to mean the national consolidated government, oddly enough. And that's what, Ham, that's what Hamilton was learning from Morris, how to do it. And the way he learned to do it was through things like the bank, things like uh, the national debt, when you say the national debt, people go, oh, yeah, the debt. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, sounds like a big problem, something maybe Hamilton had to solve, you know, when he became Treasury Secretary, uh, something he had to face up to and figure out how to cope with. That is not how Hamilton and Morris looked at the national debt. They looked at the public debt of the United States, which wasn't yet a nation, the war debt, the money borrowed to fight the war. They looked at that as a huge opportunity. To, to consolidate the money connection. These were bonds, basically, bought by um, individuals with the kind of money to buy up bonds, paying 6% interest on face value. There was no tax on that, by the way. Um, and they wanted to pass a, uh, a tax, a national tax, if, still no nation, but like a, a tax that would be pervasive throughout the country in order to fund that fund that you know, giant benefit to a small group of people. And this was how they saw building, the, unifying the country. Hamilton even said, like, in some meeting, he said, Madison just sort of went, oh, no. It was during the, during the, during the war, during the, the, uh, during the Congress, the Confederation Congress. 
He was like, he's, he's sort of hemming the idea of a, of a nation knitted together, all the states knitted together by tax collection. He's excited about this. And, you know, people are like, people, some people are like, no, no, that's a terrible idea. People who also wanted that at the time, Madison was an ally of Hamilton. People who also wanted that were like, don't, don't say that. Don't, that's like saying the quiet part loud, you know. I mean, Madison literally was like, I, he's let out the secret. That's a, that's a quote from Madison. Hamilton's letting out the secret. Because it doesn't sound like a great way to unify a nation necessarily, but you know, to them it was. I mean, the money connection, that was the thing. And this is what drove those guys. Madison was still on the team. Morris, Hamilton, uh, Washington was on this team, uh, on this side. All the nationalists were driving toward this economic nation idea that the nation is going to be a consolidation of wealth. So let's just pause on Morris and remember that that's where Hamilton learned it from, the money connection. And that's what he was pursuing with the debt. It wasn't about getting rid of the debt. It was about funding the debt, feeding the debt, because the debt was held in a very few hands. Um, and this was a way of creating a powerful, smart elite who could manage big projects and build out infrastructure and do manufacturing and industrialize and all the things Hamilton wanted to do. Um, I'm going to pause at that point in the story and say, let's just, we do need to reflect, I think, on where all this money was coming from and where all this growth was supposed to come from and where, like, I don't know, an edifice like the bank, like physically, had to be built. Hamilton created the bank, but somebody built that building, right? I mean, uh, what are most of the people in the country doing at this time? There's enslaved labor and there's free labor. I mean, most people are on the labor side of this equation, actually, the overwhelming majority of people, because we focus on the founders uh, who did these big things, but that's a tiny group of people. And all the other people are working. Uh, often physically, often for some of these, um, often f frequently for some of these far more well-off people. So there's enslaved labor, and Philadelphia um, had that. It also had more of a, I mean, a, a big piece of the slave, uh, the slave trade. And there's free labor, and there's an opposition to the Morris Hamilton idea. Yes, there's the opposition coming from the Jefferson side later, which Madison also became part of, and there's this opposition between elites, well, not, sort of two ends of the political, elite political spectrum. But there's also an opposition to this idea of consolidation of wealth um, through taxation and enriching bondholders that's coming from free labor. And e events that we know of you know, you know about the Shays Rebellion. You've heard of it. Um, it's one of the it's one of the drivers for the Constitution, because suddenly all these people are rebelling in Massachusetts, and there's no way to sort of put them down. There's no national force. Well, that was you know, it's it's useful to look at the Shays Rebellion um, as a labor action, actually, um, and later it's useful to look at the Whiskey Rebellion as a kind of labor action. The country wasn't fully industrialized, so it doesn't look like a strike in a factory or whatever, but. Um, there was a lot of, of, of pushback from ordinary free people against a lot of these ideas. So you have, you know, I, I want to say there's, okay, so there's Jeffersonians over here and Hamiltonians over here, and they're just doing this on the elite side. You've got to triangulate that a little bit and also look at, you know, there are fewer leaders to talk about. These are ordinary people. These are poor people frequently. They're not, they're not um, you know, they're not, not going to make the history books in the same way. But this was a real fight. And what Morris and Hamilton really wanted to do, I mean, later on, Hamilton, they called it democracy, you know, this, this movement. And they didn't mean it in a nice way. They meant it in a, quite a negative way. And Hamilton later, you know, said, like, our, our chief problem, really, in this country is democracy. You know, that's the problem. And so they wanted to be able to sort of suppress that pushback coming from a movement on behalf of ordinary people. And they wanted to... So they had to suppress that, and they had to kind of create the economic nation that they were trying to create. And really, what drove everybody into, back here in Philadelphia, again, same old building, you know, same place, drove them back here to create the Constitution um, was two things. The Shays Rebellion is one good example. Um, the other one, though, 
And I want to talk about that. This, this is just a moment of like not quite on the Morris Hamilton Gallatin arc. Um, the, the, the Constitution of Pennsylvania, which was adopted in 1776 as a revolutionary constitution, was truly revolutionary in a way that the Massachusetts Constitution say was not. And ordinary people in uh, Pennsylvania, and with, with limitations I'm about to underscore, um, got the vote in a way that they didn't have it in other states. Um, and so things were, this was a real hotbed because of course the merchant class is here too, doing their money connection stuff. But you've got ordinary people now in government. However, ordinary people, let's just limit that because it wasn't like suddenly, it wasn't democracy the way we would think of, hopefully think of democracy now. Um, th this was like, you might say the white male working class, you know? It wasn't like they were opening up the doors to everybody. This was a movement on behalf of free labor, but it was led by and intended largely to benefit uh, working class white men. Many women played important roles in this movement, and there were connections between anti-slavery movements carried out by black people themselves, as well as by white um, as some white abolitionists. There were some connections here and there, but when, we talk, when I talk about this democracy piece that gets overlooked frequently, we have to remember that it too was quite limited in how it defined democracy and who, who should be getting equal access to power. But they did take, the, the Pennsylvania legislature took away Robert Morris's bank charter in the state. This is by legislation. So on the one hand, you have the Shazites in Massachusetts, where the Constitution's quite conservative, rising up illegally and shutting down banks because of oppressive taxation for the benefit of the money connection. That's what the Shazite rebellion was about. And in Pennsylvania, where you have this radical Constitution where people are getting more representation, the working class is getting more representation legitimately in, in, legal, in a legal sense, um, legislative sense, they take away the bank charter. Now this is panicking the money connection, naturally, because the banks, now the bank can't operate as, as well as it could before. You had to have a charter to really have a monopoly, which is what they wanted. And it's sort of like the rich people around the country are like, well, they're just like confiscating our property here. Morris was like, the, the, the legislature is confiscating my, my, my property. And the radicals in the legislature said, That's, that charter is not your property. It's the property of the people of Pennsylvania. And so they, this, this suggested to, I mean, on the one hand, you have Massachusetts where there's no power to put down a rebellion. So the state government's in trouble. And this brought together people like, people who were kind of generally anti-nationalist, people who were really into states' rights, together with the nationalists like Morris and Hamilton and Washington and so forth, we've got to get together and do something about this. And this is what drives the, the Constitutional Convention. At least that's how Hamilton saw it. If the, if the Continental Congress had done what he wanted them to do and imposed this national tax, for example, and slowly over time, then it would have morphed into a nation. That didn't happen. He felt like they blew it. So, okay, now we have to have a do-over, basically, on how we're running things. So again, this is like, the Constitution isn't usually read this way. As uh, I was, we were talking in the reception a little earlier, and I was like, you know, I'm, I, I think of the Constitution, I'm going to say it had these financial uh, provisions that allowed Hamilton to get what he and Morris always wanted. One of those things was the bank. Um, also the, also the, the debt, so servicing the debt, also the taxes to service the debt, this consolidation of wealth, the Constitution is what enabled all that. You know, is the Constitution of the United States like really a financial technology? Like the Constitution as fintech, maybe? Uh, you know, that's quite a claim I'm making, but I think it's really useful to look at the Constitution that way in terms of the impulses that went into it. So, you know, if you're, I don't know, if you're organizing a fintech conference anywhere, any of you are, I'm happy to make myself available to, as a keynote uh, kind of thing, I, I'll show up anywhere and I'll present the Constitution of the United States as FinTech. Um, so just keep that in mind. And you online as well. You're also welcome to this service. Um, now I think you probably know some of this already, but 
when the, when, when, when the bank bill was, came, to, came to George Washington to be signed, the bank that, created, that Hamilton got through Congress to create that bank, um, James Madison had flip, flipped sides. And, he, and Hamilton was shocked to find that Madison called the bank unconstitutional, like against the actual Constitution. And this was the first time anybody ever called anything unconstitutional. And from the, again, the bank is at the center here of one of our great divisions in this country lasting this whole time, and it's going on right now. Um, is it constitutional to have certain things or not? What can government do and not do? What can the national government do and not do? That comes up for the first time over the bank. Was the bank constitutional? I don't know, you know. I mean, I don't think, uh, later on, Madison decides it is constitutional. So as a matter of high principle, it gets a little tricky to talk about it um, as, as some kind of deep philosophical intellectual thing because it was just a fight between two developing political parties. Washington signed it anyway. He made the, you know, the Supreme Court wasn't yet in a position to make decisions about whether something was constitutional or not. So Washington had to decide whether to sign it. It's like he was the arbiter of what was constitutional. Uh, he very shrewdly gave Jefferson the job of laying out all Madison's points, bullet pointed, why it's unconstitutional. And then he handed that to Hamilton to just knock them down one by one by one, which Hamilton was great at doing. And he just had a better argument. Uh, and Washington wanted the bank, and so he signed the bill. But from that weird little political moment where suddenly James Madison turns on his old partner from back in the Confederation days and starts taking this position that it's unconstitutional to do anything that the Constitution doesn't explicitly say the government can do, from which you can extrapolate many, many, many other fights over lo these many years, um, it comes about over the bank. And, you know, it's, it's a very tricky moment. And the future of the bank, as I'm about to jump to and sort of bring Gallatin into this and talk about how the Jeffersonians handled the bank, I think will bear out how weird a moment that is. I mean, we, we look back on those things as if like, well, then there was this giant philosophical disagreement about the nature of the country. Well, there has been, for sure, but it came about in, a, in an odd political fight between two parties. Um, and why Madison was against the bank gets a little tricky too, because he was partly in favor of kind of more like private lending, which Virginia, rich Virginians really like made a lot of money on. It wasn't all totally philosophical, just because it was coming from James Madison. He was a politician, and he had interests, and he had constituencies, and political battles back home in Virginia. So there's a lot more detail about that, which I'm not going to go into, but I think it's a, it's a telling point about the bank. It was, it was at the center in all the ways I've just talked about. I think of forming the nation, I mean, the bank's at the center of the system. It's a hub for the system. Government can put can deposit money there, get loans, all that sort of thing. Uh, tax money goes in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can issue notes that can be used in you know, big commerce and all that kind of stuff. So it's the hub of the system. And the Hamilton system, which was also the Morris system, is kind of a driver for not just coming out of the, out of the creation of the country, but kind of a driver for the creation of the country. So, OK, that's a big story with a lot of nuance that I'm not getting into now. Um, but here we have these anti-bank people coming along. You know, the bank opened in Carpenter's Hall. This building took a long time to build. Um, and uh, the day it opened, I mean, there was a huge sellout of bank stock. Like, it was like, okay, open the doors, and people just roared in to buy bank stock. And it was a huge success in that way for, Matt, for Hamilton. Jefferson and Madison watching this are just like, I mean, they're like in their letters and their descriptions, they're like audibly nauseated by the spectacle of what's, of what's going on at the bank. It's sort of like, this is the government of the United States kind of doing like, step right up, you know, buy some pieces of paper that are going to make you rich. It's like, they're just like, this is not what we had in mind, you know, what are you doing? That's a fundamental, you know, that's a fundamental conflict. Um, but then, you know, Act Two, this is kind of Act Two and Three, because we don't have time to really do the true drama and suspense. I mean, you kind of already know there was a second bank, so the first one didn't, you know. I can't, I can't really create a lot of suspense out of that. We even call it the first bank. Um, but they didn't call it that. So they were in suspense, you know, about what was going to happen. The Jeffersonians take over in 1800. 
So now it's on them. Like, okay, so what are you going to do here? Like, uh, now you've been, you've been putting down the bank this whole time and the whole system for which it's a hub. Hamilton's system. Jefferson ran on dismantling the Hamilton system. And Gallatin, oh, I'm going to tell you, give you a capsule description of the Genevan, brilliant Genevan immigrant, Albert Gallatin, who was Jefferson's and Madison's kind of finance guy, the anti-Hamilton, really. He was very up on finance, but he had a Jeffersonian view of the world. Um, wanted, you know, wanted less government you know, control, less, less of that heavy hand of government controlling everything, the more Jeffersonian approach. Well, he wrote, Gallatin wrote finance, finance books. They were sort of campaign books for Jefferson like about here's how we're going to, we have to take this all apart. Here's why it's not working. It's corrupt. Um, so... They come, but then they, they win, they come in, in the horrifying election of 1800, which is just a story some of you probably know that I'm not going to get into now. But they did win, and it was a peaceful transfer of power. It was touch and go there for a while, but it was. Um, they come in, and now they have to run the country, right? Because when you're the out party, you know, you can criticize everything. Now you're the in party, you've got to make it work. That's 1800, but before I move to the end, um, 1800 was a... Very important year for Robert Morris, too, remembering him, keeping him in view, because 1800 was the year he got out of debtor's prison. The great superintendent of finance, the inventor, really, of the Hamilton systems, ended up just getting way, way overextended in so many different startups. I mean, there were just a lot of canal companies and building, building companies and everything. He just had a hand in everything, and he always was, he was a lover of risk. Um, he loved to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, but it just didn't work in the end. He, you know, when, the, when the land bubble, there was a huge land bubble, and all, he owned title to so to millions of acres of land that was all supposed to, a huge speculation. It's great if it works out. When the bubble burst, you know, he, had, he owed money to everybody. He saw property being removed from his fancy house here in town. He fled to one of his other properties, but they chased him, brought him back. He was thrown in jail. And that's the great, you know, that's one of the great financial minds of our time. I don't, I'm, I mean, he actually, I'm not of our time, of their time, um, but, one of, but of our country. I'm not being sarcastic when I say that. He was, but this is, you know, the, the, the cycle of boom and bust absolutely came to get him in the end. And he got out of prison in 1800, thanks to his, some of his friends in government, you know, tweaking the law a little bit to make it easier for him to get out. Uh, the money connection, and um, he died very shortly thereafter uh, in poverty. So that's, I don't know if it's a cautionary tale. I don't even know what to make of it. It's just, you know, the game is the game, and it came for him in the end. Jefferson's, Jeffersonians come in like, oh, well, all that corrupt, crazy Morris money connection stuff, that's all over. They ran on that, and they were very popular coming in, and they had all branches of government, and, uh, it's, you know, it's looking pretty good. Jefferson's idea was to tell Gallatin, you know, since we ran on this and everything else and you're the finance guy, great, take it apart. Just take it apart. Make it go away. And Gallatin realized, I think he probably had already realized this, but he looked at the system that he had to start running day one. I mean, the Treasury Department was this, you know, it was a series of wheels within wheels within wheels, and it was running like this 24-7, and he had to jump on that, manage it, a lot of employees by then. It was the biggest department of cabinet. Um, and he just realized, he said to Jefferson, you can't, you actually can't just dismantle this thing. He said, his quote is, is a paraphrase, but he said it's the most perfect system ever devised, Hamilton's system. He didn't mean, it's 18th century, so he didn't mean fantastic, wonderful, love it. He meant perfect, like complete. Take, that's what, a more perfect union, you know, a more complete union. That's what they meant. It sounds... To us, perfect means something, you can't be more, more perfect, it's just, but they meant more complete union, and he meant a complete system. Pull one piece out, there's no telling what kind of chaos is just gonna happen to the country. So his idea, far more sort of realistic than Jefferson's, because Gallatin really did believe in dismantling Hamilton's systems, some of them, um, was, his idea was to do it slowly over time. Like, you can't just pay off the debt with one giant tax. You know, that's not going to work. He told Jefferson, I can pay it off. We can get this with discipline, patience, fiscal responsibility, not overspending in government. We can get this thing down 
gone in maybe 20-ish years. Jefferson's like, what? You know, that we came in to just kill this thing. But he'd listen, he listened to Gallatin. He didn't like it. Um, so Gallatin comes in as the fiscal responsibility guy who's not a lockstep Jeffersonian. He wants, you know, he wants, he wants uh, industrialization too, and he wants infrastructure in this country. And so did Jefferson, really, you know. The idea of Gallatin and Jefferson was we can do that big government stuff when we can afford to. And we can't afford to until we get rid of this debt. That was their idea. Gallatin went to work. Now, this is Washington, D.C. now, not here, right? The government's moved. All of the government's moved except, of course, the bank. The bank's here. And this is something that Philadelphia has. You know, I mean, this banking history thing, this is the center, because I mean, this really also goes back to Morris. It's the money center. So they moved to Washington, but they didn't move the bank to Washington. Um, and they couldn't shut down the bank. Jefferson's like, I, I want to shut down this stupid bank. This is like the symbol of his idea of Hamilton's corruption. But it had a charter for 20 years. You can't just override that. It was a, Congress had passed a charter. So the idea is, yeah, we get to, we get to that year that year of uh, 1811, like, well, that'll be a glorious day. We're going to shut that bank down. Now, here's the time bend problem, because I'm getting close to the end of my talk here. Uh, and then we'll have, then we'll have some Q&A and some, some further discussion. But here's the time bend problem. Gallatin was Treasury Secretary for both Jefferson and Madison. Uh, he didn't go all the way through Madison's second, uh, second uh, term, but he went, through, he went into his second term. That's a long time. That's like he was... That's almost, he was a Treasury Secretary for almost 16 years. Now, here's the time bend problem. I've just talked about all the backstory, and I really want to talk about Gallatin, but there's really, it's not just like a time lapse problem. It's kind of like the content to understand what Gallatin was trying to do um, is all created by Hamilton and Morris before that. And so there's this issue, which is the fact is Gallatin is a really interesting guy, if you look at him. If you look at what he did, but unlike Hamilton, he doesn't have. He was actually a very patient, hardworking, nose to the grindstone. He didn't have that, you know, that juice that Hamilton brought to everything. Um, and so you can't spend as long on Gallatin as you can on Hamilton. You just can't. And this is this is something that's confronted me as the, a storyteller, as a structurer of narrative and a character, a, a, a creator of character, creator. You know, I try to understand the characters of real people. Um, but here's the tragedy of Gallatin. I'm going to give it to you kind of, kind of briefly. Um, he really, he sat there in Washington every day at, at his desk. He stayed all summer when everyone else left. And Washington in the summer now isn't necessarily where you want to be, but then it was really pretty gross. The city was hardly built. There were open sewers running around. It was just not a nice place to be. He sat there. He, st he was away from his family. He missed them. He sent them out of there uh, in the summers. He sat at his desk and he whittled down the debt. He did. He whittled it down, piece by piece. Remember what happens during Jefferson's administration. Does, does government stop spending money? Does it become this lean, mean thing? Does the, cover, does the country get somehow smaller? Or does it get hugely bigger because of a purchase of a giant, giant piece of territory? Cost a lot of money, had to be done by debt financing. Hamiltonian, Jefferson's just freaking out about what he's doing himself. He's in this complete constitutional existential meltdown about what he's doing. Gallatin's like, it'll be okay. We can, we can still stay on the schedule. I found another way to, mm, this is the way he is. Okay, we can handle that. It's, it's all right. No, just, Jefferson wanted to like, write a constitutional amendment, amend the Constitution to enable what he was doing because he thought it was unconstitutional. Gallatin's like, eh, you're just reading the Constitution too tightly. Like, you can do this. You're the president. Just do it, and I'll find the money, which he did. Uh, the Barbary pirates, trying to suppress them, cost money and huge military expenses that like, Gallatin's like, we can't afford this. And Jefferson's like, this I have to do. Uh, and he, so yeah, Gallatin goes finds the money. Uh, toward the end of Jefferson's tenure and the beginning of Madison's, Jefferson pushed an embargo act, which just sent the country into a complete financial and commercial meltdown. No, nothing coming in, trying to, pun trying to avoid war with England by punishing them economically, as if like, oh, they need us more than we need them kind of thing, but they didn't. It was a total disaster. This one, Gallatin really, he was trying to be like, yeah, it's okay, I can handle this. 
he was actually saying, you know, even war might be more cost effective than this embargo act. Uh, I don't want to go to war, but if we have to, we have to. But this is killing us. Um, when that was repealed, um, he continued to try to get Congress to do fiscally responsible things. But now, okay, time has zoomed by. This is the time bend. He's a party elder now. He's a stern party elder, and there's all these new young hotshots coming into the party, the Jeffersonian types, but a new generation, like Henry Clay uh, and Calhoun, and people who, some they didn't really remember the revolution, certainly hadn't fought in it, and Gallatin's confronted with this kind of insurgency within his own party where they don't want to hear any of this kind of stern fiscal responsibility stuff. They want to, like, have no taxes, no internal taxes. They want, uh, they want to uh, have, take on no new debt, and they want to fight a big war with England. This is, and he's going, he's telling Congress, like, you can't do that. You've got to, we have to have some military preparedness. I want to issue some bonds. I want to, I want to do some taxing. We have to do these things. Um, okay, so the bank charter comes up. He's learned long since that the bank is critical as a hub for managing a nation. You need something like this. Um, he, he's, he's no longer saying, let's shut down the bank. He's like, let's recharter the bank. I don't want to do it the way Hamilton did it. He had some tweaks, uh, governance issues and things like that. Um, Congress now is just filled with this kind of rabid Jeffersonian, I mean, even Madison is like, maybe we should recharter the bank. But no, he just can't control his own party. Uh, the president is sort of like, he's, and he's not saying, I insist we recharter the bank. He's being Madison. He's like, maybe he's got a point, you know, which is like, yeah, he knew it really kind of had to be rechartered. But Congress just won't recharter the bank. It was a close, close fight. In the end, Vice President Clinton, uh, George Clinton of New York, had to break the tie in the Senate. The bank was not rechartered. So now there's no, there's no national bank. Uh, there's no, they've rejected taxation. The, the financial state of the country was kind of paralyzed when, in 1812, the country decided to go to war with England against all of, all of Gallatin's advice, which by this time they're calling him a new Hamilton. You know, it's like he's betrayed the party. He was just kind of giving, doing his old, his old thing. He's just being fiscally responsible and patient and like, we don't, you know, he still was trying, he was on schedule to pay down the debt. He's still on schedule, uh, trying to be. Well, now it's just a complete disaster. I mean, the country goes into a complete financial collapse during the War of 1812 because no one's thought this stuff through except Albert Gallatin and no one's listening to him. So that's kind of the, the tragic arc of Gallatin. Um, I feel for the guy. He doesn't have the charisma factor of a Hamilton. Um, that's part of what was good about him. He was just a nose to the grindstone guy. So now I'm gonna end by giving you some, um, some statistics. Um, when Gallatin, I have to write these down because I can never remember numbers when I'm talking to people. When Gallatin took over, the end of the Federalist moment. The debt was at $83 million. Um, by around 1812, through all the kind of work I was just talking about, dealing with all the stuff I was just talking about, which was expensive, overreached by government, um, he got that down to half by 1812 through unbelievable effort. When he left office, two years later, the debt was at $120 million, which is three times what he had gotten it to through all those years of hard work. And it's a third more than it was at the end of the Federalist period. And the government was running on a $17 million deficit. So his entire goal, which he had dedicated everything to, really failed. And in that sense, I think you can say, if you want to have the argument, you know, Hamilton versus Jefferson. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, you can look at all the boom bust stuff that sent Robert Morris to debtor's prison. Um, and Hamilton, as you probably already know, had to like bail out his system a couple of times with a lot of creativity, and this has gone on. Or you can look at the Jefferson thing and be like, well, then look at, you know, look at what they did. Look what they did. Did Jeffersonianism ever really work? You know, was it ever really ap applicable? These are questions that I kind of leave a little open. I think both, I think there's a lot to kick around there. Um, so I'm going to close with a couple, of, a couple of these questions just for your, your sort of further thinking, because I don't have answers to these things. On the issue of what's constitutional and what's not, when you remember that it came up over the bank, and that by the time by the time the bank recharter came up, Gallatin's like, I mean, Hamilton, Madison, I'm sorry, Madison is like, yeah, maybe we should recharter the bank. This was a guy who passionate, passionately created an entire intellectual line of thought 
that we now call like strict constructionism or something, you know. But he didn't really believe it at the time. It was political. How seriously are we to take these, some of these issues? I don't know. Uh, and the other one is, um, okay, I've gone back and forth between Hamiltonianism and Jeffersonianism in this kind of like, they both have downsides um, way. Were there any alternatives? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say alternatives were proposed by those small D Democrats, leadership of those small D Democrats. They weren't all anti-banking, actually. We have this whole thing where like, democracy is about being against centralized banking or whatever. No, I mean, if you look at what Thomas Paine said about national banking, nobody was more radically democratic than he. He went over to France and was part of the French Revolution. But he was against Pennsylvania's legislature withdrawing that bank charter back when they did. And that was the government that he had done a lot to set up, a radically democratic government. He had other ideas. He felt that the poor were, if anything, underbanked. And he invested in Morris's bank even though he hated the money connection. So there were other ways to think about this. Um, and I think for now, I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. And before we go to q and I'm going to say thank you um, to, of course, the Museum of the American Revolution, about which I've you know, people who know me and know my stuff know that I don't say this kind of thing often. I mean, I just think this is a great uh, public history institution, and uh, uh, it's just very exciting. It's very exciting to have been really kind of involved in a, in a weird way, you know? Uh, um, and to learn that I was involved, which I didn't know until... <laughs> I mean, I, learned, I knew it before tonight, but I didn't know it when it was happening. So that's really been really cool. And so thanks to everybody here, um, and thank you all so much for physically being in a room with me. Uh, and thanks to all of you who are not physically in the room uh, and who have been listening and, and maybe sending in questions, I hope. Um, it's, it's been really exciting to get back kind of on this horse and, and try to ride it again. Um, so thank you very much. feel Gallatin. I grew up not far from his home in oh, Western really? oh. Pennsylvania, and so I don't know that I appreciated how much he longed to be there. That's a nice place. Yeah. He had a nice sure. place there. Yeah. yeah. Tyler. We're going to send our first question to our friends online, and then we'll go to the room. Um, Thanks for a great talk, Mr. Oglin. We're getting some really good feedback online, and there's an interesting question about how today we don't let people run the government's money theoretically until they've gone through years and years of schooling and they've been trained. This was an era of different education. So um, the question is, where did someone like Al Albert Gallatin get his financial acuity and did people weigh that experience any differently than he was doing well? Wow, that is I've been wondering that very thing myself. Um, and I don't think I have a great answer to it. Gallatin, um, you know, I, I couldn't get into everything about him that's interesting in his... Uh, in, in the time we have, but he came from Geneva, um, which was a, a hot enlightenment hotbed, you know. Um, that's where the philosophes, some of them fled when they were being gonna be, you know, arrested. And his grandmother knew Voltaire. Uh, and he, was, he sat on Voltaire's lap when he was a little kid. He was probably one of the most sophisticated people in this country at the time, you know. Um, that doesn't give you finance acuity, though, necessarily. I mean, I don't know if Voltaire had any, you know. So uh, I, I, he studied really hard, which is exactly what Hamilton did. I mean, they learned it by reading books. That's, they didn't go to school for it. There was no, like, business school. There was no finance school. Uh, Hamilton read... Um, he read all the greats, obviously, but he, he loved uh, Jacques Necker, the uh, also Swiss uh, uh, finance minister of France, and Gallatin actually met Necker uh, because he had that kind of intellectual upscale, those kind of intellectual upscale connections. But I don't know, you know, it was definitely more informal. And I'll say one other thing uh, about that, which is that ordinary people whatever that means, you know, just but not, non, not total elites, not specialists and so forth. I think they had uh, a better understanding of, of the importance of economics and finance in their lives and more detail than some people do today in the 18th century. I get that from some of my reading uh, of, of, of more advanced scholars of that, of that question. Thank you. you oh, let me hand you this, uh, then they'll hear you on the internet. 
I usually have too big a voice if I... <laughs> he mentioned the military, and I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about the relationship between the creation of the finance and banking system and the federal taxation system. I, I was always impressed by the idea that when the powers that be realized that we didn't have an army to defend against the second coming, or even to put down a little whiskey rebellion from five counties in Pennsylvania that were going to secede from the nation and Shays' rebellion, that there was a need for a national budget and taxation system so we could have an army and protect ourselves. I'd like to hear you say a little bit more about that. Yeah, the Shays' rebellion, uh, you know, Hamilton and, and Washington and their, their crowd, uh, Morris, Schuyler, et cetera, um, they wanted a national-type army in peacetime when the war was over. And they tried to get it through the Confederation Congress. But that, that body was becoming increasingly inert um, after the war. And a lot of people in the country, uh, a lot of leaders in the country, didn't think a national army in peacetime... I mean, before the nation was even a nation, they wanted a national army, a type army. That was seen as, in some ways, like, you know, European tyranny, you know? Uh, you're supposed to not have a standing army. You're supposed to just have militia. So this was an early fight, and it was exactly the same fight as between, I mean, it was, it was eh, maybe, no, that's too, that's too simple. But th some of those issues do line up along the lines of who's for the bank, who's against the bank, who's for taxation, who's against taxation. Um, and really, yes, the Shazite rebels were trying to undo the system that existed before Hamilton could really perfect it, which did exist to try to, you know, tax lots of ordinary people to enrich a few bondholders. That was the system. And the, re the rebels rebelled against that. And so the need for an army is partly to be able to suppress people who are going to try and rebel against systems designed for bondholders, you know? Um, and that was, de so those, those things are closely connected. I'm going to go to the back here. I appreciate your narrative um, and the way you're pulling this together. If I can, too. The farmers, how did they play in relationship to how did they think about debt? You talked about the workers, you're talking about what was the farmers? Thing. And the other one is when the bank, when this, the doors open and the bonds were being bought, were they internal? I mean, just the quote unquote by that time state, or were they other people who had, who seen um, value in buying U.S. bonds by, through the bank? Who were these people who bought the bonds? Oh, who was, like, say, bu buying those bonds? Yeah, well, that's, that's really interesting because, you know, obviously to have that many people running in the door to buy them, it wasn't just uh, the, the bank, the bubble in bank stock um, was democratized to a great degree to the point where everybody, if you had anything, you could, people were borrowing money to buy bank stock. Um, and borrowing at high rates. And if you had anything you could borrow against or sell, you would sell it to get a hold of this script, which gave you, a, which was the actual piece of paper that allowed you to buy the bonds. It was a classic, you know. I mean, we've been through this recently. We, this, is not, this is not like it's always been going on. Um, it was a classic bubble, and it was a cl everyone just like stop everything you're doing, leave your leave your artisan shop, leave your farm. If you've got a you got a, a scythe, you can sell. You can buy some bank stock, and you'll be rich. Um, that was really going on. It did, it did have a, demo, a democratized element to it. Um, the first question about debt in another sense, though, is also really interesting because, you know, how did your average, I don't know, farmer or free laborer or artisan or ever see this debt issue? These people were crushed by private debt. Um, they, they frequently, I mean, the, again, the money connection made their money in being, by being merchants, uh, but going way back into the colonial period, before there was any banking here, uh, uh, and, and Britain did not want us to have banks here, um, there was private lending. There was a kind of a lending industry, which charged incredibly exorbitant rates to really struggling people. And it was a classic debt cycle where you can never pay back the original debt. You're just in a, a revolving cycle, of downward cycle of, of, of payments, of interest payments to maybe your own landlord or the person who's going to become your landlord once, they, once you, they foreclose you and they take your farm and now you're a laborer for that person. So there's the big public debt, which we've been talking about a little bit, which had to do with the bank. But there's also this private debt issue where the same people who were the money connection wanting to um, themselves you know, be public creditors were private creditors on a fairly mass scale 
to poor people and, 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 and the, the movement I'm calling like the democracy movement, the labor movement, um, they would riot. They didn't have the vote, so they would riot about this kind of thing. There were debt riots frequently. And this was just another thing that the Constitution was partly uh, created in order to suppress. Concerning the uh, funding of the bank, did the sale of bonds continue throughout the 20 years? Was that the main source of funding revenue uh, for the government since they didn't have internal taxation? Oh, yeah. And, and if any of the bonds also were long term, after the charter ended, what happened to the government's obligation to any outstanding bonds? Uh, yeah, okay, I see. Um, the idea of paying down the debt, which Gallatin was so committed to, was to pay off that long-term obligation. Uh, though that obligation did not disappear, and it had to be met. Um, the bank stock is something of a different issue. Um, but they did have to go on paying the bonds that really... Hamilton issued a, set of, a, a whole bunch of bonds that were supposed to... You're supposed to hand in your, your original war bonds and get a new issue of debt. And that's when he assumed all the state's debt in the, in the federal debt, which I did not actually mention as one of the prongs, critical prongs of his, of his fintech uh, that was, that was the, uh, the Hamilton system. Um, so those long-term obligations persisted, and the government had to, had to pay them, although they did default uh, at one point during the War of 1812, I guess on treasury notes. Um, so the, and the first part of your question had to do with... Um, Oh, right. I'm just, what I'm trying to do, actually, is make a distinction between the bank stock, which was one thing people invested in, and the public debt of the United States, which was, were these war bonds that had, that had been, uh, the debt that had been created by the war. Those are kind of two separate things you could invest in. Um, once the bank charter was removed, the bank was sold, and I didn't get into this final tragedy of Gallatin in a way, but the bank was sold, its assets were sold, and the physical building was sold to Stephen Gerard, a name pretty well known in, uh, Philadelphia, I think. Um, and this is actually off your question, but it reminded me that I meant to say this before. Um, uh, Gerard uh, was one of the richest people in the country, and by that time, you know, this is second generation rich, next generation rich. Gerard made like Robert Morris look like a piker, really. Um, and, and Gallatin was so desperate toward the end, when he, right before he finally left his position with the country collapsing financially, he was so desperate that, uh, to, because they were, going to default, and the, the government wasn't going to be able to run, and he couldn't get anybody to buy bonds because there were no taxes to, to support the bonds, and they didn't have an internal revenue service anymore because the, they abandoned that in the first part of Jefferson's. There was just nothing going on. Um, he had to bring in the three richest men in America, Gerard, but also John Jacob Astor, and David Parrish, another financier and banker. These three bought a whole bunch of bonds, they bought them in bulk at a discount, he had to offer them a discount, which made their take like far better than face value. And then they could sell them at face value and they got a commission from the US government also on that. And confidence in them was higher because these three richest guys in America were into the, were buying them, or had bought them. That still wasn't enough money and the, the financial system still continued to collapse. But the tragedy of that is because of this potential default issue and all that stuff, Gallatin had to do things that like, you know, how, how is that not Hamiltonian except like not really well done, you know? I mean, he, he completely reversed himself in a way. He, he didn't want to necessarily, he didn't want to be dealing with, with having three rich men kind of admitted to finance. They, were, they had to set finance policy, really. They were unofficially the bankers. The, the, they became unofficially the bank, really. Um, because there was no bank. But that meant that the Jeffersonians went far further, really, than the Hamiltonians in this thing that they had called corruption before. And this goes back to my final questions, which is like, how seriously are we supposed to take this stuff? I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting to talk about, but is it, is it actually philosophically, you know, valid? I don't know. So that's just something I forgot to bring up. So I thank you for your question about the potential for default, because it was there. And, uh, and back on Gerard, you know, one of the... One of the th he had nine hundred thousand dollars in federal fines for smuggling during the uh, embargo act, which a lot of people did. There were shootouts between federal agents and smugglers. I mean, it was crazy. Um, so he got that settled partly by becoming the last 
the bailout of, you know, the last bailout guy. Um, and he became really, you know, an unofficial kind of money, it's, it's like the money connection writ large. Uh, Astor and Morris and Parrish are like prototypical robber barons from later in the century, really, in a lot of ways. Um, it just wasn't what the Jeffersonians said they were going to do when they took office in 1800. I'm going to start in the back and then come way up to the front. Uh, where, if anywhere, did, did external debt such as debt to, to tobacco merchants in England fit? Uh, is it a separate category? Uh, this is a, a... The great thing about these questions is they're all related to things I didn't have time to say. <laughs> so I, I would be less, like, frantic if I knew. But not all audiences are going to ask me all the things I didn't, I didn't get a chance to say. We do focus frequently when we talk about the war debt of the United States, the Revolutionary War debt. You can look this up online. You can go to some very supposedly sophisticated websites that are trying to educate people in founding finance. And they'll, they, they'll say, oh, the United States had a debt to, um, you know, a public debt to foreign, to foreign lenders. It's true, the United States did borrow from France, there were, there were private lenders in England, there was, there was money coming in from outside. The interesting thing is that, you know, the money connection idea all had to do with, I mean, it had to do originally with kind of the domestic debt, right, not the foreign debt. Morris, Hamilton, everybody wanted U.S. bonds to also be attractive on the European markets, of course. Um, and, and, the, and the Louisiana Purchase was financed, really, with the first issue of U.S. bonds um, introduced solely on the European market. But there was this other tr sort of tranche of debt which had to do with the, f with the foreign debt. And we did, and that, this was something that got paid off much more quickly. Hamilton didn't want to pay off the domestic debt quickly. He wanted to, to let the money connection know, this is a long-term play. You're going to get paid on this for generations, potentially. Um, but he di they, we did want to pay off the foreign debt uh, more quickly. Um, so, yeah, there, w there was this whole other piece of debt that I didn't really talk about. I partly don't talk about it that much because it's overemphasized uh, in, in many other versions of this story, but we should not leave it out, so I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. A more basic, well, question and a half. The half question is, what did Gerard do with the bank building afterwards? And the other question is, on a, a more basic level, other than the theoretical argument that having a national bank was unconstitutional, what was the real opposition to it? Uh, the first question is about what Gerard did with the bank. He bought the building and the assets, and he started Gerard's bank. Um, and it, it's a little interesting thing in and of itself, because um, Gerard was, you know, he, he was a verticalizer. You know, Robert Morris was into everything. Uh, Gerard and some of those guys were more about, like, let me buy this, because that'll help me get make this happen and lining, st lining stuff up, you know. Um, and he opened the bank as a, pri a truly private bank, um, which means he didn't have a charter from the state of Pennsylvania. They wouldn't give him a charter partly because he was a, an immigrant from France and there was prejudice against him for that reason. So he opened it without a charter, and that was unusual when he, when he did it. Um, so it became Gerard's bank. And then it, the, in the later story of Gerard's bank, I mean, it becomes no longer really Gerard's bank, but it's still called Gerard's bank. And I, it's sort of a, a, a Philadelphia banking story in and of itself. But that's what he did. Um, and the other question, yeah, what was driving opposition to the bank, to the national bank, to national banking, besides the philosophical question of whether the necessary and proper clause and the interstate commerce clause enable it or don't enable it, which we could argue about forever, what were the real interests? Um, and you know, they were multiple. Um, partly state banking was beginning to come along and a lot of people who were anti-national banking were pro-state banking because they had an interest in state banks. Um, so that's one thing. And the state sovereignty people, the state's rights people, um, liked state banking but didn't like national banking. And many of them were in state banking. So that's one reason. Um, another, I mean, from Madison's point of view, I think there was another issue, which was partly that he had a political problem at home in Virginia when he started questioning the bank. Um, and he was questioning all of Hamilton's systems suddenly, not just the bank. 
Um, he had a political problem back home because he had really been the father of the Constitution, of course. And a lot of state sovereignty people, especially back in Virginia, like Patrick Henry, didn't like the Constitution, were against it. And Madison was trying to prove something here, I think. He was trying to prove... Patrick Henry said, you know, this is an, an instrument of government overreach, this Constitution. Um, it, they can do anything they want. He said, you read that... Henry said, you read that necessary and proper clause, it means they can do whatever they want. Madison was trying to prove Henry wrong, I think. You know, the reason that Madison was in the House and not the Senate, which was the more august type of upper house body, and, you know, this was James Madison, a pretty, pretty important person. He was being punished politically by Henry's political machine for having done the Constitution, really. So that's why he was in the House. And so um, I think he was trying to prove to people like Patrick Henry, no, I have not helped create a tyrannical document where they can do whatever they want. They can't do anything it doesn't say it can do. And so I think the, 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 the motivations were both, you know, uh, financially interested, but also kind of politically interested. And I think Madison had sincerely was leery. You know, he, when, even when he was on Robert Morris's team in the Continental Congress trying to bring taxation about, national type taxation about, he voted against the bank, the Morris's bank, the Bank of North America. He voted against that. So I think there were, the motivations were complicated. Some of them were personal interests, some of them were political interests, and some of them were philosophical. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoagland, we'll be signing books and answering further questions where I'm standing. But before we do that, the prerogative of our last question by tradition goes to President and CEO R. Scott Stevenson. Well, I want to get personal here, Bill. Uh-oh. I want to know where you came from. Uh, and by that, I mean... Uh, you know, most of the folks who are sitting on the stage in this position have come through universities and are university faculty. Um, and all I know about you is you were born in Virginia and uh, grew up somewhere near New York where you continue to reside. Yes. So I'm curious true. about how you could have came to do the work you do, your interest in public facing history work, um, where you found this particular niche that you've gone down a deep rabbit hole in. <laughs> Uh, and um, and as we think through the next couple of years and the 250th anniversary coming along, how you know what your aspirations right. might be like for how um, we who are in the public history sphere might uh, work as an ally to move uh, public discourse uh, in a different direction than it's been around history yeah. and its significance. Okay, so we have another hour, right? So okay. <laughs> um, I'll start at the end. You know, when this, uh, when this sesqui, when this 250th thing comes around, my plan is to be living on a beach somewhere, and not even remember what the American Revolution even is. So we'll see what we'll see if that can come true. Probably not. Um, I don't, you know, guidance on like how to handle it. You know, wow. I think I, I see this thing coming like a freight train in my from from where I sit. It's it's funny to me. I. I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know what people are going to do about it. I don't know, you know, you know, you know that I, I, I love what goes on here. I would, of course, like to see more of this ability, which is like threading a, a needle. It's like, I don't know how you do it. Because um, it can't just be people like me being all like, it's all about money and negativity kind of thing. But, but uh, you know, we can't have that. That can't rule. You got to get people to, you know, how you, you, you kind of manage an upbeat, you know, legitimately celebratory thing with, um, with some significant realism about major issues, uh, some of which have to do, of course, with, they have to do with all the obvious things that we're, you know, they have to do with race and they have to do with uh, class and they have to do with all kinds of things that don't usually get you know, when you're talking about the realities of how these things have gone uh, since the founding and during the founding, you know, it's not all, it's, it just can't be all celebration. It can't be all high-fiving yourself about having done this. So I don't, I don't know. I say good luck to you. And uh, I know what you'll do here is going to be closer to anything I could imagine being the right thing. And I don't know what else is going to happen out there. I, I, I'm, I actually won't probably be spacing out on a beach. I'll probably be watching it with some interest, but I'll probably be watching it. I don't know that I have any real leadership role to play in that. And the first part of your question was personal, right? Uh, when you know, I looked up all the people. Who, oh no, the sign's not here anymore. They, right? Read the Revolution series. I've done it before, and I was like, wow, man! Like th these are the people. I mean, I, I'm you know, 
it, it is actually quite the honor to be, you know, because I'm not, I mean, to clarify what Scott said, you know, I don't have a degree in history. I am a writer. I'm not, uh, in that sense, a certified historian. I don't teach. I don't have an academic background in this. I had to kind of stumble my way into it and still stumble my way through it. Um, so I don't know what got me into it. I mean, I, I, the short version of that is like, I found out about the Whiskey Rebellion and I was like, that's gotta be a good story. Because as a writer, that's what I was doing. I wasn't doing this founding history stuff 20 years ago. Um, and I was, you know, I mean, since you said we're getting personal, I'll tell you, frankly, I was kind of at the end of some of my ropes as a writer. I was just not sure where things were going for me. I just wasn't, do, the things I wanted to do weren't really happening and weren't really taking off. And somehow, for some reason, that Whiskey Rebellion, like, let's do a nonfiction book about the Whiskey Rebellion uh, for general readers, not a scholarly book. I don't know, I was right. It was a, it's an incredible story, but it just also cracked open an entire world to me that I had not yet been involved in, and I got a book deal, which was great, you know, and I got a book deal right at the time when uh, the kind of the founder craze was going on, and that's really why I got the deal. It was a, another founding period story. So it was a good deal, and it launched me into a whole, like, oh, I can do this, and it turned out I could, you know, um, and I wasn't, I wasn't young when this sort of epiphany occurred, so it's been a good run. <laughs> it's been a good run. Excellent. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Bill Hoagland. Thank you. Thank you all. It's really fun. We, we, we promised him just a moment to uh, have a sip of the cold beer that's sitting right through those doors right there. <laughs>